river of nickels, the changing nature of artist compensation. Um, it really builds off of some stuff we've been talking about over the past two days. Um, but it, we're trying to sort of focus specifically on artists, re the revenue generation uh, portion for artists from different genres and at different stages in their careers. And it's amazing how many, uh, the folks we have on the panel today, they represent a range of artists uh, working in different genres. They have different roles uh, of what they do and uh, how they facilitate artist revenue streams. And so I think we're going to have a really productive conversation. Um, I've asked the, the panelists just to give us a very brief introduction because I know they represent a, a variety of clients and I thought I would just let them speak for themselves. Um, but let's, we'll keep it brief. So Mark, do you want to start us off? Hi, I'm Mark Cates. My company is called Fenway Recordings. Uh, I'm based in Boston for lifestyle reasons and uh, my roster includes MGMT, Mission of Burma, The Cribs, Saves the Day, Francis and the Lights, and a few others. Um, my background is almost entirely involving records and record labels. I've only really been a full-time manager for five years, but um, I'm glad that I made the transition a as late as it feels now. I'm glad I made it when I did, and uh, so far, so good. I've learned a lot from this guy. <laughs> <Bruce>. Absolutely, <laughs> by example. I feel like I was raised in the music business by your band. Wow. <clears throat> Well, my band is R.E.M. I'm Burtis Downs. I live in Athens, Georgia, for lifestyle reasons. And, uh, but I like to come to Washington, D.C. for summit reasons. And um, I've worked with R.E.M. since very, very early days when uh, I was just getting out of law school and they were just starting out. And uh, it's kind of the same job in a lot of ways, and it's a lot different in a lot of ways. Thanks. Amy Blackman. I am based in Los Angeles. My company is called Cookman Nacional. I manage Ozil Motley and have for 14 years. I manage Money Mark, uh, Mexican Institute of Sound, North Tech Collective, Atercio Pelados, and co-manage Chris Franz and Tina Weymouth. And uh, so most of my bands are bilingual, not by design, but by default. It's just sort of what I fell into. Hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Janai Thornton. I'm based out of Atlanta own a business management firm called Envision Business Management Group. We provide accounting services to clients specifically in the music industry. Our clients include Ludacris, GZ, CeeLo, Lloyd, Music Soul Child. Thanks. Hey, I'm, I'm John Strom. I'm, I'm a, uh, an attorney. I'm based in Birmingham, Alabama, most definitely not for lifestyle reasons. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, I had a, a fairly long stretch as a as a an artist playing in in some successful and some less successful bands throughout the eighties and most of the nineties and and uh, now my practice is is almost all on the artist side representing artists some producers some indie labels. My name is Ed Pearson. I live in uh, Seattle, Washington now for lifestyle reasons. Um, I was in Los Angeles not for lifestyle reasons for a couple of decades. Worked at Warner Chapel Music. I was the general counsel there for a number of years. And uh, I do private practice now representing uh, uh, music uh, companies and musicians in Seattle and uh, also starting up uh, this month a music publishing company called Inside Passage Music. Hmm. So um, I think we all understand the sort of, well, there's assumptions made about how artists are making a living in this environment. We talk about it a lot at the Policy Summit, but there's assumptions made that um, you know, the emerging technologies, the changes in the landscapes have improved musicians' bottom lines. I am question that assumption, though. I think it's improved musicians' access to the marketplace. It's improved their ability to build fan bases. But I don't know, and I'm not sure any of us know, uh, whether it's actually improved their access to revenue. And so I thought, under that premise, we could talk about what it looks like from an artist's perspective with all these different panelists. And I thought I'd start with the sort of the big thing. We, we tend to think of artist revenue in the sort of traditional sense as falling into three, or three buckets. There was the money that you made from selling your records, the mechanicals, you know, the physical product. Then there was the money from touring, you know, from performing. Um, and then there's the money from your brand, merchandise, and in, for some artists, you know, appearances and things that, you know, are respected to their persona. So um, I thought maybe there's a lot of things that are wrapped up in those. There's mechanical royalties, there's physical sales, there's the digital sales, have those gone up? Has live performance money gone up or down? I mean, are, my, are artists getting bigger guarantees? Are they getting less? 
is the cost of touring offsetting potential higher revenues from the guarantees? Um, what about revenue generated from digital performances, which didn't exist 10 years ago? Um, are there more licensing opportunities? I thought I would just throw all of those out there because <laughs> that's a huge amount of information, but it does give us an entree into what people think in the sort of global context about how the buckets are being filled these days. So anybody, would you like to start? I don't know. I'll start. I mean, I think that it's, yeah, all of the above, but at the same time, no, none of the above because every situation is different. I think it's dangerous to talk about this stuff generically. I have a client roster that includes people on kind of both ends of the spectrum. I think that, you know, I've been lucky enough to be involved with MGMT who showed up at the right moment and have benefited from that. Timing is actually really crucial. Putting out a record in a year where there aren't a lot of great records in people's minds makes your record seem bigger and better than it might even be. Um, but the opportunities that they get in many of the realms that you just mentioned are not available to everybody that I work with. In fact, most of them aren't available to anyone else that I work with. And many of them are not available to a whole lot of other artists. Um, so I think it's, I do, I am an optimist by nature. I'm a half full person. I do think there are more opportunities, including revenue opportunities for artists than there have ever been. But you could walk out of here all inspired by that and not find them or not find them available to you. So, I mean, I think that there are some big themes that come up at a conference like this, like people becoming educated about, thing, about in particular, sound exchange, that, um, you know, anyone who isn't getting what they deserve from a fundamental, on a fundamental basis should do that. But it doesn't mean that if you submit for something, you're going to get it, just like anything in life. It's, it's, I think that the most dangerous message we could send to anyone is that it's out there for you, you just have to show up. It's more like you have to go out and earn whatever it is you do in your career, which has always been the case. I don't, I don't believe that that's changed. And the, the flip side of it is that there's so much more competition. It's so much easier to enter the marketplace from a positive standpoint via TuneCore, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't mean you're gonna get heard and the traffic may actually produce the opposite result and you might not get heard. Anybody else want to jump in on that? You want me to jump in? Sure. Well, um, I agree with all that. Um, I, I, I was a recording artist signed to labels in the 90s. And, um, you know, back then we, we just assumed, unless you were phenomenally successful, that you would never make a nickel from recordings if you're on a label. It was just, that was a given. It's like, well, we're a million in the hole or whatever. And uh, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure that's familiar to you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> From from having worked at, at major labels, and, you know, you spend an enormous amount of money making the record, and you know, back then, you needed to use a professional studio, and the label would insist that you use a certain, you know, producer engineer. And one thing that I see is an incredibly positive change, uh, you know, since now that we're sort of into this new paradigm where where artists have access to fans, and and you know, are not uh, solely trying to impress certain gatekeepers, is that you know, it's much more possible for artists to make music without that filter of, you know, a label saying, well, you know, we don't, we, we don't hear a hit or, or we want to see it in a certain way. And uh, uh, one of my clients is, is the band Bon Iver, And uh, that's been a really interesting uh, case study for me because, you know, that's, that's one where sort of everything has gone right. You know, when I first started working with the artist, it was just a guy with a couple songs on MySpace and a self-release CD. And, you know, now it's an international act. And, you know, it's, it's basically one guy, but he's done it essentially entirely on his own terms without ever having, you know, anybody involved in it say, like, maybe you should do it this way. You know, it's, it's exactly, you know, sort of creatively what he wants to do. And I don't think that he probably would have had those opportunities in the 90s because it would have had to, you know, get through those, those gatekeepers. And, uh, and, and also, you know, some artists who are recording for independent labels, I mean, there's some issues with them, but I'm actually seeing artists who are, who are getting to that level who are making pretty large sums of money from artist royalties despite declining sales. Artist royalties from? From their recordings. D yeah, from digital, physical, together. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah both. And, and it's, it's also a given that there's, you know, there's rampant, unauthorized acquisition of, of these <laughs> records. But people are actually paying for them. And I see the royalty statements, and sometimes they're quite healthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I saw plenty of royalty statements back when I was an artist having a career, you know, 
with bands that were actually selling records that were way, way, way unrecouped. So that's pretty interesting. But also I'm seeing, you know, I, I work with a, a number of uh, singer-songwriters, you know, uh, several in Nashville and, and uh, you know, not in the country genre, but in, in the sort of singer-songwriter, you know, pop folk genre. And, and I'm seeing some artists who are making a very, very good living pretty much just from syncs, which is really cool, you know, and syncs being media placements, uh, movies, television, commercials, and, uh, you know, making real six-figure incomes just mm -hmm. from owning all the rights and just, you know, <laughs> creating the kind of music that's, that's you know, considered syncable and, and uh, you know, generates income that way. But the frustrating thing is, I mean, you look at something like Bon Iver and you're like, oh, okay, so I see how he did it. You know, he got this great review in Pitchfork and then, you know, got this record deal and then, you know, and then it just kind of took off and, you know, went out and toured. And, and you know, you can't really get a blueprint from that because it's, it's you know, each case is unique. And, you know, I've also had incredibly frustrating experiences where I'm working with an artist that I think is fantastic and other people think is fantastic. And, you know, you can just never get up that, over that very high noise floor for all the stuff out there. I mean, you know, the, the competition is enormous and, and it seems like the, you know, really great music kind of finds its way, but that doesn't always seem to be the case. Yeah. Um, I thought I would ask Ed, um, since you've worked in publishing for a while, I was wondering what you think the changes in the publishing um, revenue stream look like? Well, good. And also to amplify what John was saying, what Mark was saying, you know, one used to make statements about music publishing, about recorded music, and they, they t you, could, you could make generalizations perhaps easier. And today, for every story that goes one way, there's another story that is, you know, 180 degrees different. Uh, and so I think that in music publishing, like in all of uh, uh, the, the, the things that we're going to talk about, there are many different uh, uh, ways to go and many different uh, uh, what appear to be uh, contradictory uh, uh, rules and, uh, and so forth. So it's, it's more complicated, it's more interesting, and with that comes more opportunity. But in music publishing, for many, many years, you had two major buckets of, of, of income. You had mechanical royalties and you had performance. And I think that um, those of us who were in music publishing, those of us who were songwriters, those of us who own copyrights to songs, uh, had the great windfall of what now looks to be an aberration, and that was, you know, those, those couple of decades from the early 80s uh, to about 2000, uh, before uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the decline of the sale of music. And so mechanical royalties was an enormous source of income for us, and for many, for songwriters and many artists. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it was. It's changing. And as John points out, a lot of the, the, uh, uh, the difference is being made, made up in the sync world. Uh, licensing, licensing for games, licensing for, for film and TV and so forth. So um, there are now many, many buckets of income. And as the panel title suggests, um, they're smaller buckets. So we're talking about, you know, analog dollars to digital pennies. The music publishing business was always a pennies business. So perhaps, you know, music publishers are better equipped to handle the new realities. But we're talking about little streams of, of income and many of them and uh, it's not uh, necessarily the glory days of uh, huge sales mm. of, uh, of records. Janai, I thought I'd ask you because, you, you know, since you're doing business affairs, if, do you, does that resonate with you, the many, many, many small buckets? I think the number of sources of revenue have definitely increased. What I've noticed, particularly dealing with um, artists who are more so in the um, urban or rap music, they have so many more outside opportunities as it relates to licensing. Mm -hmm. um, because they have such a persona that their fans identify with, those are where majority of our opportunities are coming from now. So obviously royalties are down, advances from record labels are down significantly, <laughs> touring is up, um, international touring is required, and they, um, depending upon the persona and how it translates to the marketplace, have huge opportunities for um, businesses or licensing arrangements that have nothing to do with music at all. So I think the more sophisticated that the artist is and the more sophisticated their team is, there are more opportunities that are available. Um, thanks. Um, Amy, from your perspective, I, you probably cross boundaries more frequently that your, that your roster does. So how does it look from your perspective? Uh, well, for a band like Ozo Motley, I mean, I feel like SoundScan is about as relevant to 
a benchmark of success as SAT scores are to intelligence, and it really, you know, I just, <laughs> I, you know, it pisses me off, and, it, and it's frustrating because, you know, they're a huge brand, and their sales are really disproportionate to the size of their brand and always have been, and, you know, I'm pretty sure everyone in here has heard of them, but have they sold a lot of records? No. Um, you know, they go out in the traditional, you know, I guess working class blue collar band sort of way and they grind it out on the road 200 dates a year and they do a, a ton of social justice work which grows their brand um, significantly as well and they align themselves with all kinds of community causes and they interact with their fans on a, a very fundamental level and so, you know, the... No, I mean, I, I don't think that there's all of these tremendously new and different pools of, of income available for, you know, bands that tour by nature and don't sell a lot of records and don't have hit records and aren't sort of in the national public eye. I think it's sort of, you know, just the nuts and bolts of working really hard, interacting with your fans, cultivating your fan base, and basically saying no to nothing. We don't say no to much. We take every opportunity that's offered. Bruce, what do you think as someone, uh, as, a, as a band that's had a long <coughs> career arc? Well, I mean, the, the thing that's been set up here, and it's you know, true at every conference, is that all, all situations are different. There's such granularity and specificity to any example you're going to use, it's really hard to make general statements. You know, there's, Neil Young once talked about, you know, some of the records sell better than others, and you kind of have an arc of a career. And, but the, the thing, I think, is the, um, the kicker is that while there's um, sales on an overall basis being down, you know, clearly the unauthorized acquisition, you know, there, there's definitely a, a, there's a cultural shift in terms of people consuming music versus people paying for music. You know, at, at one point in time, if you wanted to consume music, you pretty much had to pay for it. That's just not the case. As Jim Griffith puts it, we're, we're in an era now and have been for a few years where uh, the act of purchasing music is a voluntary act. It just, it's something that isn't required anymore to listen to music. So how are we going to um, get to the point where artists are able to make money? I think that artists are going to always be artists and always find a way. Their expectations may change. They may make less money on a relative sense. But as, as John said, artists never really set out thinking that they're going to necessarily make money off records and publishing. It's always a live business, typically. I mean, I guess some do because they're songwriters and they don't tour. But if you're a touring band, a typical uh, touring band, you're planning to make your money on the road and you're hoping to uh, do something out of, uh, out, of, out of records and I think it's still the case. So um, what, do, what do folks think have been the most disruptive business technology, um, sorry, disruptive technologies or business models that have appeared in the past, say, 10 years, and the ones that are the most beneficial from your, you know, from your perspective, and I imagine that people have very different answers to those questions based on the artists that you represent or the people you work with. So, I mean, if you want to talk a bit about the disruptive versus the beneficial technologies as, you know, the past 10 years? I don't know, John, got any ideas? <laughs> well, let's start with the positive. Okay. Um, you know, I, I really liked uh, what, what Je Jesse Von Doom said, uh, was on the last panel had to say about, uh, you know, his his generally pro artist stand and and you know the emergence of a of a middle class of of you know professional musicians and uh, I wanted to echo that a little bit and you know I, I'm on the legal side so I don't in, engage in the same level as, as as say Mark for example in management but. I do see a lot of, you know, I, I, I love working with the sorts of artists that take a great initiative to, uh, you know, to engage with fans and, and to, uh, you know, figure out ways to, to turn what they do into a cottage industry. And, I mean, it's a lot to ask of somebody creative to, to be that engaged in business, but I think it's the reality. It's very necessary. And, you know, and... and some of the most successful artists these days are the ones who, who seem to enjoy that. And, you know, I, I come from a generation of musicians, you sort of do too, uh, Kristen, where, um, you know, it was, it was not considered particularly cool to, uh, you know, to be available and, and engage with fans. And, you know, I, I toured with bands that would, uh, you know, make a point of never engaging with fans on any level. <laughs> I mean, I didn't personally, I, I'm, I'm a friendly guy, but I definitely worked with musicians who were like, you know, would build a wall between fans. And 
I remember I had an epiphany when I, in the 90s, I was in a band called the Lemonheads, and we were touring, uh, and our opening act was this band called Matchbox 20. And uh, they were brand new Atlantic signing. And, uh, you know, we'd go straight to the tour bus and just make fun of the people out there standing around, you know. And, and we'd see these Matchbox 20 guys out there sort of shaking every hand and, and you know, sort of, uh, you know, like, you know, kind of go into every radio station. And we're like, oh, that's so hokey, man, you know, whatever. But, you know, by the end of the tour, they should have been headlining, you know. And it was like, oh, yeah, that is your market you know those are the people who are going to buy your stuff you know and and i think what we're seeing now that that for i think happily the culture has shifted and it's generally considered okay i mean there's a lot of things it was also not okay to license your music back then because you know you wouldn't want to you know have your precious music in like a you know a television out. show or something like that it was terrible but you know now there's a pragmatism and that's great and and i am so for you know, musicians figuring out a way to, you know, create their art on their terms and make a living doing it. And I think there are, you know, far more opportunities to do that now, and it's far more culturally acceptable, which is great. Um, you know, on the negative side, uh, you know, we're, we're competing with free, and we have been for some time. And, uh, you know, I think that's just a reality. And, and you know, whatever we can do to, to you know, um, you know, enforce rights or, or, you know, encourage people to... to pay for something that, you know, enriches their life is great, but I mean, that's the reality. And so I, I think, you know, in terms of, you know, how we present, you know, the, I hate calling it a product or content or any of that crap, but, you know, how, how we make music available to people for, you know, and, and get the message out that, you know, it, it, if, if, if we, the creators, get paid to, to, to make it, then, you know, we won't have to get a crappy job and we'll be able to do it more and better. Wait, did you just say we're competing with free? That's amazing. That's what you said? What? Did you say that? I, just, yeah, I, I don't think I coined it, but oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's really cool. No, that's really cool. <laughs> wow. Um, competing with free. We're competing with free. Um, have there been any surprises from your perspective uh, as managers? Um, any, any things, of course, things, there's lots of things we can't foresee, but um, opportunities your artists have been presented, maybe it's, oh, you know, getting perfume branded or whatever, just stuff that you just never perceived as possible with, you know, the fact that the artists were originally around to record music and play shows. So, you know, any, anything that's popped up that's been a, just like, what, you know? Anybody? I, I have one. Um, yeah, Ozo Motley was asked to be the morning show hosts on a Clear Channel commercial station in Los Angeles. And, uh, and they did it. And, you know, to think about a, a band getting up at five in the morning every day and being on the radio was pretty extraordinary. Yeah, it was Monday to Friday morning show. Um, for how long? Uh, they, a week or? No, no. It, <laughs> they did it for six months until the program director got fired. Um, and, it, and it was actually a really amazing opportunity, um, you know, because they, they tend to be, you know, they're, they're glib and they are funny and so we sort of tag team them up in in sets of two every morning and switched off but you know that was something we never fathomed would be a possibility to a touring band and um, you know and then they would can shows when they had to go on the road so that was something that was pretty cool while it lasted I wish it was still around yeah Ed did you have one yes if I could combine the uh, the question of the most disruptive mm -hmm. and the most surprising and the greatest opportunity and I think that it is afforded by the 360 model which has been talked about I think in the last couple of days but I just want to just give my own take on it and just a couple of opinions I think it is it's the most disruptive if we're talking about artist compensation and we haven't even seen the impact of that. I mean, uh, it's going to be five years from now or ten years from now when artists who are signed to 360 deals, then dropped, uh, then look at their contracts and see that there's an ongoing obligation to pay uh, a percentage of all these re sources of revenue and potentially tying up rights with a company that no longer is interested in them as recording artists and yet uh, they have the merchandising rights and yet they own the copyrights to the songs and yet they have uh, income flows that will go on for years and years and potentially in perpetuity. So I think that's going to be an enormous, uh, of enormous impact at a moment in time when these revenue sources are declining. So, you know, when you look at a songwriter uh, and the songwriter income, mechanicals are going down. It's harder to make the same amount of money as a recording artist songwriter today 
than it was 10 years ago. And yet the, the, re the record company that you're signing to is saying we have to have a piece of the publishing as part of the 360 deal. And that's going to last a lot longer than the record deal is. And uh, I think that's going to be very, very disruptive. What's surprising to me is that it's not just a few companies, and it's not just the major companies, but it's an increasing number of companies. And companies that are viewed as indie and as artist-friendly are increasingly adding components of the 360 model into their own deals. And I think that's surprising to me. Um, I guess it's surprising to me also the number of artists that are willing to take these deals on, um, not, not knowing potentially what the ramifications are down the line. Finally, opportunity. I think the opportunity is for, for indies, both record companies, publishers, to uh, work with artists on some, on some other basis. I think when, when deals are that all-encompassing and that heavy, uh, with that comes opportunity for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for less onerous deals. Yeah. Did you know, did you have some thought? Well, when I was thinking about, you know, the disruptive business model, you know, what's very common um, for urban music is the mixtape. And, you know, we encourage the young people to download them. And then we expect them to turn around and purchase music after we've already encouraged them to download it for free. So it's a very powerful tool. To, it's a great marketing tool because it's always released a certain amount of time before the um, CD is going to be released. So I think we are sending mixed messages. And we want children to, or young adults or whoever they are, to use a certain set of rules at one time and then transition to another set of rules. And um, that music is so prevalent. But again, I think we are um, reaping the benefit, but also paying the price for it as well. Yep. Anybody else want to weigh in? On a, yeah? I was going to say, um, I think technology is positive um, as far as disruptive. I, I think, I don't know, I think it's, it's all part of the same conversation. You have to have disruption to ultimately achieve progress on a certain level. And I, I think that we've all been going through this for a while. And I, I, I think to me, the main difference in the time I've become a manager is that to think about anything based on record sales and record companies primarily is a mistake. No matter what level the artist is at, I just don't think you can count on anything anymore. And you know, for those of you that think about MGMT being a really big band, their second album, uh, which clearly uh, divided the critics to say the least, um, was a pretty sobering lesson, honestly, for all of us in terms of what things are like these days when you aren't the new hot thing that everyone's excited about. And um, one of the things I've been thinking about just sitting up here is the amount of time we spend talking to our publishing partners as much as the people we're in business with for recorded music um, on the label side in terms of the opportunity. And it's, you know, th the first MGMT album had a lot of success in terms of sync and licensing, as well as, to be really honest with you, Airplay and the entire traditional record model that I, for one, had kind of not necessarily given up on. I had certainly given up on doing it personally after trying to run an independent label for a while. Um, but I, I saw things happening in the recent past that I didn't think could actually take place anymore. Radio stations adding a song without it even being sent to them. You know, As someone who spent a lot of time doing record promotion and getting my brains beaten in every week, it was really hard to believe that that could still take place in, in this decade. Um, but I, I think that you have to just try to find what's out there wherever it can be. And there does it does feel like, and I think this is... As I say it, it's going to sound pretty naive, but there's, there's a fairly limitless fear of licensing opportunities for artists at all levels, and those that are not going to be looking to get rich off it probably have the greatest opportunity, which, again, theoretically, in a very naive way, might turn into something more tangible down the line. Hmm. What's with, it, with all the it feels like there's just more and more opportunities out there, but knowing which ones to put your resources into and your time into and your human, human power into, is a real challenge. There's just, there's just a proliferation every week of something new that you just heard about, you hear about at a conference or somebody sends you a link to, but how to de who's, who, what, to, what to throw your resources at. It, I, I said before, I think record companies have changed so much, they're getting nimbler, they're getting smaller, they're paring down, 
But artists still need teams of people to go out and get the work done. Not all. Some artists do it themselves completely or have, have a, a helper in an office in their hometown or something. But other artists really want to get that team of people that you know, make it kind of look easy, but that they're everywhere that week that their record comes out. And at whatever level, whether it's an indie la la label or a major label or a management company or some kind of combination of all that, whatever the deal, labels used to really be full of just armies of people doing one thing getting you on the radio. That was basically what they did. That was the key. And now it's less people working much longer hours um, with a whole lot more on them trying to do a thousand things. And that's just, record companies are kind of becoming more like management companies and management companies are kind of having to beef up and become more like record companies. Uh, let me just sort of bounce off that and ask all of the panelists, I mean, you know, has your relation, I mean, sorry, has your role as a manager or business affairs manager or an attorney changed over the past 10 years to you know, are you doing things for your artists now that you didn't do 10 years ago? I, I bet so. Absolutely. But, yeah? I mean, I, you know, I think I, I have a couple of thoughts. One is kind of going back on the last couple of topics. One of the biggest problems with the music business these days is that it's hard to have lessons to draw on and people to learn from. And there's, I think there's two reasons for that. B having a label background, and again, I made the lifestyle comment because I spent 17 and a half years in Los Angeles and... Ten and a half of those at Geffen Records, which was a pretty unbelievable experience, uh, and and probably not even really relevant to most major label experiences ever. But that's where I ended up. Um, I work with people at labels that clearly don't work under people, or haven't worked for people, or learned from people that could have taught them anything. And I'm really lucky to have had the experience of the old record business when almost nothing that we're talking about existed, and the companies weren't owned by multinational businesses that were mostly making their money in other areas. The whole thing was just completely different, and it was really more about throwing things against the wall and seeing what stuck. Um, I, I, I think that as far as what you have to do as a manager, I think you have to assume that you have to do everything. And the people that I look up to that are really successful at what they do, like the gentleman to my right, um, and certainly in, in Amy's case as well, and the company that she works at, I mean, these are people that created a business that did not exist and did so very successfully and actually even introduced models. On a very basic level, though, I think you have to assume, even if you're in business with a major record company on a successful level, you can't count on anything anymore. Um, because the people that you work with have too many priorities, too many artists, too many bosses on a certain level to answer to, to give you the attention that you might think you deserve. And basically, if you're waiting around for something to happen, it's probably not going to happen. And that isn't their fault. It's your responsibility. Mm. Amy, you've been representing Ozo for a while. Has, what, have you, what are you doing now you didn't do before? <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much all of it. <laughs> um, you know, it, it was really challenging um, on an international level on this last album release to actually coordinate and orchestrate the global release of a record for the first time because there were foreign affiliates but no international coordinator uh, position at the label that they're on. So I was actually interfacing with the, the, all of the affiliates at, on the marketing plans and the marketing of the records. You know, it used to sort of be from a management perspective. We were responsible for delivering the band to the market and then we could sort of, you know, theoretically rely on our label partners over there to adequately take advantage of the band being there and market the record and know who they were and be prepared for them. But, you know, that's not something that I learned now you can sort of take for granted. So I had to do it myself and handhold everybody and, and actually at times not rely on them at all, which gets very frustrating for a band who goes halfway across the world and then says, why did you send me here? Um, which I hate getting those phone calls. And well, you send them in Mongolia. I mean, <laughs> my band would right probably away. call and ask the same question. Yeah. Well, actually, when they went to Mongolia, they were like, when can we come back? But, <laughs> um, you know, when you have 1% of the population of an entire country at your show, it's pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me want to go. Um, anybody else, you know, are you doing things now that you didn't do 10 years ago for your artists or your, you know, clients? Yeah, I think the role of the um, entertainment attorney, the music attorney has changed dramatically and really, as, you know, as, as music changes for musicians, it changes for the representatives as well. And, you know, I think that there was, there were a, a, lot, a, a lot of years where uh, music lawyers had lines, you know, on their desk of files and these were the publishing deals and these were the record deals. And uh, that was the cottage industry. And so you could be very specific in terms of what it is you did for your client. You, you went, 
you got them a record deal, you negotiated it, you negotiated a management deal, you negotiated uh, a publishing deal, and from you know, at least two of those sources, you got big checks that you, you know, were entitled to 5% of or your hourly rate that you'd been accruing up until that moment of time. And those days are, are really gone, so they're just, they're fewer deals. And, and really, one of the things that hasn't been, been, been spoken about is just sort of the, the, the death of the middle class of the music business. You know, the, the, million, the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that were pumped into developing acts that lawyers, you know, it, it became their work uh, doesn't exist anymore. So I think what happens is we've gone back to a business where the music lawyer is a general practice lawyer and they're helping their client with all sorts of things in terms of, all right, we have a, a, a website, we're going to sell, we want to sell th uh, merchandise over here and so forth. So I think the skills that, uh, and the work that a music lawyer is doing for their clients is greatly expanded uh, and as the, you know, the, and much like the, the various income pools, you're making a lot less money and doing a lot more work uh, with, uh, with smaller uh, revenue streams. In tell, each. Us, tell us more about the old days, man. Oh, <laughs> love, love hearing this stuff. Well, 10 years ago, you know, I was in a van, so it's, it's irrelevant. But no, I, I, Are you still having to make tour books for people? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, 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 some, some, uh, you know, like one of my biggest clients doesn't have a manager, and, and uh, um, you know, very, very successful uh, band. You all, I'm sure you've all heard of, does not have a manager. So, so everyone else on the team has to kind of, uh, you know, pick up that slack, and and uh, it works, you know. But, um, you know, it gets a little. I mean, I, I, I wildly prefer to actually just be doing strictly legal work because you know, I can bill for it and it makes sense, you know, and, and but, <laughs> yeah, wildly prefer, but that's not, you know, the, I'm also always making calls and, and, and doing stuff that, that, you know, a manager might do and, and the roles are not so tightly defined. But one thing that I think is interesting, this doesn't relate directly to me, but one thing that I think is interesting is the changing role of the labels. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Kristen and I both come out of this culture of, of, of you know, in tastemaker indie labels, right? You know, the, the indie label is cool. And, uh, you know, it's not cool because it's trying to be cool. It just is cool. And um, that culture is very much alive. And, you know, if you, there's been a lot of talk over the last, you know, at least five years about the death of the label and do we still need labels, you know? And, and uh, I mean, do we need, need major labels? On, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think that they, they serve an important purpose, including, you know, getting artists on the radio. And, you know, if you want to have a huge career, it probably makes sense to be affiliated with a big company like that, but the indies, closer to my heart, uh, I think serve a very important role in the market, which is going to become way more important as we come into this new paradigm of, you know, availability of all music, you know, and, and you know, and via whatever sort of, uh, you know, portal you have to the, to the internet uh, for digital streaming or whatever, you know, that coming reality, I think labels are going to continue to be important because one function they serve, which is vitally important, is this filtering slash taste making function of, you know, um, there's so many people out there who are going to pay attention to anything on Merge Records or anything on Secretly Canadian or anything on Sub Pop or whatever. And it's like it becomes a brand distinguisher in a very important way, a very important, important and organic way that's built on, you know, a, a reliable history of, you know, I don't know if you want to call it curating or what, but actually finding, you know, great talent and, you know, facilitating or developing it to the point where, you know, it's out there. And, and I personally think that's super important. Yeah. Um, I would, Janai, I was going to ask you sort of a technical question because I assume you see um, a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure other people on the panel do as well. But um, I wonder if you think it's actually easier to be a business affairs manager or financial person now because there is, it's not just like, royalty sheets on a piece of paper, you're probably getting tons and tons of data. I mean, um, how does your role change in just sort of organizing and facilitating the, the flow of money? I've been in music 12 years now, and in the past, we've been able to play a very traditional CPA role, and the role is essentially the same, but for our clients who have been very successful, we have to play that role across a multitude of companies that have nothing to do with the music anymore. And so the, um, the artists, or even I have some producers who have been very smart, very entrepreneur in nature, and have leveraged their celebrity 
to create new businesses. So now, instead of us just being able to do tour accounting and logistics and tax returns and retirement and insurance, we have to run all of their various companies now too. So what I've noticed is um, our expertise has had to change. Mm -hmm. And um, the people who support us and the other um, people who are part of the team, instead of our client typically having their normal uh, music attorney, we may have three or four different attorneys based on the level of expertise or area of business now. So the team is broadening now. And uh, what's harder, I think, is for you know most people who, who've practiced normally have a particular area of expertise. So now we are building, we're trying to pull resources from different people because we know we have a very short window. Mm -hmm. And for, our, the again, our genre of music, we've noticed the window's getting you know, shorter and shorter and we're just trying to leverage it and create revenue outside of music. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, we have about 10 minutes left, right? Approximately, so um, let's go to questions. Um, Chris. Go up there and find somebody. Uh-oh. <laughs> not the guy in the purple shirt, not him. No. <laughs> <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Um, so Mark, you, you mentioned MGMT's second record, uh, and that fascinated me because I, I love these conversations about business and technology and everything, but we don't always do a good job of tying it back to how it impacts the actual art, the music that people are making for good or for ill. Uh, so I'm curious if you could just elaborate on that second MGMT record a little bit, because, uh, you know, I mean, I guess it divided people, but at the same time, to me, that's the sort of like artistic risk taking that we're all supposed to celebrate when people do it. So I guess I'm curious about a couple of things. First of all, like, how do you guys as a team and, and the guys in MGMT feel about that? What might their me next step artistically be? Uh, and then maybe if other folks on the panel can, you know, give us specific examples of, I guess my main question is, is it easier or harder these days for artists to take chances given the environment? It's a good question. Um, I, I guess I'll try and address it succinctly and just say that um, the most important thing about this album for them is that they were allowed to make it and that they really weren't interfered with and the amount of support that we got from Columbia Records in this day and age to do something ambitious and, and really what they were feeling at that time. Um, I, I don't think it's a typical situation, honestly. Um, I don't know what's going to happen next time. I think, that the, I, I think that it will start the same way. I think the band will kind of try to figure out what they want to do and we'll see what happens. But um, there's a lot more I could go into, but with 10 minutes left, it, it wouldn't really be appropriate. Um, as far as like, I, I think in general, the climate these days actually does allow people to be more ambitious. Whether or not they choose to do so is really up to them. This case that we're talking about is just unusual for so many reasons. The main one to me is that none of, none of what's happened to these guys in this phase of their lives was either predicted or even um, planned. Uh, they weren't actually making music together at the time they were approached by the record label. It was based on some stuff they had done in college that was more like most things you do in college. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't take it seriously, it just wasn't necessarily their life's ambition. So if things about that artist don't make sense to you, that's something to keep in mind. Um, it's been really incredible, really amazing, really positive, and in a lot of ways there's a lot of things I could talk about that's hap that have a lot of things that I could talk about that have happened to them that are positive and exciting. But I don't think there's anything more important than them having the ability to do artistically what they're feeling. And I think that the record they made is the record that they had to make, and and it was it was what they wanted to do at the time. And to be honest with you, despite what I said earlier, it has still reached a ton of people all over the world in a very positive way. And and uh, fortunately, um, they're able to operate as a live band at a really high level and a very exciting one. Yeah. Sound, it sounds like a band that's going to be a career artist, which doesn't you know it's almost an oxymoron. I mean that's. I, I, we only have eight minutes left now, so I'm not going to give you okay. 10 seconds on all our records, but I mean, they approach them from a very pure standpoint. They make the record they feel like making that year, and you know, as Neil says, some do better than others, and that's kind of other people's, when you put it out there, you make your art, you put it out there, and it sounds like your guys come from kind of a similar place. And let me just add this one very brief thing. The amount of support that we've gotten from the artistic community 
about this record has been amazing. People that have felt the need to go out of their way to let us know how strongly they feel about what these guys have done. And for me, as someone who's spent a lot of time in the A and R realm, it was it's just great to have these conversations and get this kind of reinforcement like we just did. Great. Uh, yeah, Chris. Hi, this is a, a question about, I'd like uh, Janai, Janai, if she would, to elaborate on a, a point that she had. My name is Ayinde Alakoye. I'm uh, the CEO of Hitch Radio, which allows users to hitch a ride with friends as they listen to radio stations around the world. Um, and Janai, you were making a point about mixtape uh, when you were talking about disruption. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Thank well, you. What I was saying was is that you know the mixtape is used as a marketing tool, and it's available for free. And not only is it free, we encourage people to download it, to listen to it, and share it. <coughs> so we are sending a particular message when we do that. So then in the marketplace, when we want those same people to purchase the music, I don't think they understand why they have to or why they need to. So although I think it's a very effective marketing tool, and it always has been, um, I think we are creating confusion in the marketplace. And we are asking people to have different sets of behavior for the exact same thing. So that was my point. Did I answer your question? Okay. All right, Chris. This actually stays with the topic of mixed tapes as well. I mean, you've seen lately uh, sometimes brands will present the mixtapes like Mishka did with, uh, I've done with other things, Scion's done lots of them, um, Ten Deep did them for Wale. And I'm wondering if you see that as something that's going to continue and maybe how far down the food chain it's going to go. Um, and if also maybe just for all the other managers, do you actively try to sync your artists up with brands or do you just sort of have an essentially passive role and you wait for the phone to ring? Anybody want to take the, I mean, there's a sort of a, extra bit about mixtapes um, and, you know, how widespread they are, but also questions about, um, you know, actively looking for branding and licensing opportunities. I have one quick point I want to make about branding. Um, and this, you know, and it, each each genre has its own culture, and uh, you know, and and what's considered okay. And I think it's interesting that that you know, among many of the artists I work with, who are sort of coming out of indie, uh, you know, there there's certain real sticking points about branding. And and it seems like in you know in hip hop in particular, it's just like uh, you know, it's it, a full embrace of branding. And I I think that's interesting. And I think. There probably are creative ways for for you know artists who are prickly about that to you know to 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 do more of the, you know generate more revenue through through uh, endorsements or branding and and uh, but but I think I think a, a lot of the the reasons it doesn't happen are are, are cultural. Would you agree with that? I, I would think so. But I have a sort of a technical question for managers. Do do the calls come in? You know, and you're sort of fil filtering through yes, no. I'm not interested. Is that how it works? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just, it, it, it depends. I, I don't think there's anybody I work with that is pressuring me to associate them with brands. Um, and uh, I also think that in terms of the rock world, while there's been plenty of this stuff that's happened historically, it, yeah, it does not work at a level of uh, other genres of music where some of this is done. Although having said that, when you go to see U2 at Gillette Stadium, and below the three world championship banners that I'm glad to be able to make reference to in this panel, <laughs> there are Blackberry banners. Uh, I was pretty shocked at that, honestly. Um, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not to get on that path, but um, to answer your question, I think there's probably a pretty big disconnect, to be honest with you, and, and that comes from having pretty high-level con conversations with people involved with serious brands that are definitely actively interested in putting money into music and having associations and and uh, you know and not on a uh, not on a stupid or gratuitous level there these are people that come at you knowing full well what you're about and what your artist is about um, I also just want to throw in because I, I was looking for a moment to make this point um, I find it funny but it has to be explained especially to artists of this era that 
back in the day, alternative rock really had a lot of rules, and John alluded to this earlier, but it was, and it goes way beyond things like sponsorship and, and licensing. There were musical rules that, you know, had to be adhered to, and all of a sudden, at a certain point, people didn't follow them, and the entire genre got a lot bigger. Um, so I think you have to be careful, especially in an environment like this, where most of us have a background, ultimately, in independent music scenes and communities and artists that, you know, it, there aren't any rules there, for anybody in any realm. People need to do what they feel, whether it's business-wise or artistically. Yeah, but there are sensitivities, and I, I've seen this. I had one artist do it, do a, uh, an ad campaign that, that seriously pissed off their fan base, and, you know, the blogs went crazy. And, and uh, you know, and it was interesting to see because it was like, you know, the market basically saying, no, we're not going to, we're not going to go with that, you know. We've been confronted, or we've been asked about some sort of brand and song affiliation forever, and the guys have just never done it. They've been fortunate enough to not have to. They've made their other money other ways. They've just never felt like it was something they wanted to associate a particular song with a brand. At the same time, I'm very happy to report that the reason I'm rushing out of here today is that our band is being covered on Glee tonight. Glee, I think, is on Fox. It's a cool yeah. show. All our kids watch it, and, you know, the whole neighborhood's <laughs> coming over to watch it, so... I don't know, is that branding? I don't think it is. I mean, we've always allowed our stuff to be used in TV and movies. We think it's kind of a joint artistic, you know, if they want to use a snippet of What's the Frequency, Kenneth, as somebody's driving down the road, we generally say yes to that. We've said no to a few movies and a few TV shows for taste reasons, but we almost always say yes to that. But then we draw the line uh, at commercials and, and sponsorships and endorsements. At the same time, we play a lot of festivals that are sponsored by Virgin or sponsored by Humo Magazine in Belgium, you know. So... These lines, we have some fairly absolute ones within our organization, but they're just very personal to our guys. And, you know, Nick Drake, who is somebody we've all looked up to as a touchstone for music since, the, since we've heard it whenever we were in college or whatever, produced by Joe Boyd, he, you know, his, he only got famous 30 years after he was dead because of a Volkswagen commercial. Is that, was it a Volkswagen commercial? Yep. Pink Moon, yeah. So, and then I think there's another song, so who knows? Yeah. Janelle, you had a thought? I think for branding, it happens both ways. I think some people are very intentional in trying to associate themselves with brands, and I think a lot of companies understand the influence and the power of celebrity. And they aggressively pursue certain artists, certain genres of music to um, influence consumers. So I, I think it's probably about 50-50 how it happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, anybody else have a thought before we move on to another question? Yeah, okay. We have, we have time for we have time for one more. One up here. Um, th there's been a bit of talk about um, about behaviour and the way that um, that revenue is, is, is sort of drained out of the industry. Um, how incumbent do you think it is on on the artist to actually um, so I suppose raise that that difficult question, but basically, you know, show a bit of leadership and say, hey, you know, I mean, if we if we don't earn money, then we're just going to be on the road as travelling minstrels. So you know, it's a, it's a hard thing for artists to raise, but I think there's probably a, a time. Would you agree to, um, that artists need to take a bit of responsibility on themselves? Responsibility. I have a friend that uh, is also a manager, and uh, he told me a few years ago about a conversation he had with a client who's extremely successful, who everyone in this room is aware of. Um, and for whatever reason, he was inspired to say to his client, there's something wrong if you're not working as hard as I am. Um, I thought that was a really succinct way to make that point, and I think it's, I think it's true, and I think it's, if, uh, like I said earlier about a manager dealing with a record company, if you're waiting for someone else to do something, you should probably do it yourself. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think in this environment, it's important to mention that if you think that a manager is going to solve the major issues in your career, you're probably wrong. Um, there's so much information out there. A conference like this, which is, you know, webcast and archived, and there's a lot, a lot of information just being circulated here. There's got to be something for almost anyone who thinks that they aren't where they should be, and most of us probably should feel that we aren't where we should be. Um, because, I don't know, I always think about Thriller selling 40 million copies and, you know, the, the, the world population and all of that. Um. Um, I thought I would just would wrap up the panel with just a, a broad question about where you would urge advocates, um, people who support musicians, um, you know, policymakers, um, what they should be focusing on to ensure 
that our compensation is fair in the future. This might be, I mean, obviously this whole conference is about that, but from your perspective, is there things, you know, sort of tangible things we should be working on? To me, where that, uh, the opportunity is and the need for is between the 360 deal in which one company acquires all of an artist's rights mm -hmm. and the silo, the, the artist silo. And T-Bone yesterday said some, some wild things. He said some profound things. But one of the, the many things that, that, uh, that I thought was a, a great point uh, was that, that uh, artists need to write songs. They need to work on their craft and so forth. And if they are working on all of the items of commerce that need to be done and trying to figure out how to get their songs uh, to Pandora and so forth. And yes, it's gotten easier, but still, there's so many things need to be done and there's so many issues. And as these revenue streams increase, the need, I think, and the opportunity uh, uh, is in the area of finding that middle road, being an independent manager, being an independent publisher, being the party that can help assist that artist without having to sign a 360 deal, and on the other hand, not being in a silo and having to do it themselves, but rather a cooperative effort in which musicians and business people who can represent them fairly for thin margins can move forward. That's great. John, you have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I, I'm sort of focused on the question of, of, you know, in the future will there be sort of an intrinsic market value in, in recorded music and recordings. And, you know, I'm, I'm a producer engineer as well. And, and uh, you know, I you know, was interested in what T-Bone had to say yesterday because obviously he's on a very high level with that. But, you know, and he said some things that I consider sort of flippant about, about the, uh, the market for recorded music. And I personally think that, you know, we're, we're, you can kind of see where it's going. You know, you can see that, that you know, most people are gravitating towards digital streaming and there's some, some business models that are emerging. And, and I think that the conversation that we need to be having, and by we, I mean rights holders, artists, uh, you know, potentially the government, um, potentially the, you know, the telecoms, is, is how to come up with a, with a, a structure, you know, of both licensing and, and, and compensation that makes sense and is sustainable and, and has an eye to the, to the fairly distant future, and I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a great optimist in this regard, and I think there's a way to do it, and I, and I take as a, as a given that, that people who, who love music and music enriches their lives are, are willing to pay something for recorded music, and, and I think it's just finding, you know, uh, a, a way to do it, and I think it's going to take a lot of cooperation, and that's, you know, that's where I'd like to see the conversation go. Tonight? Um, I read an article on Billboard a few months ago, and I forgot who they were interviewing, but he made the statement that we in the music industry need to come to terms with the fact that music is going to get to the point where it will be completely given away, and that we are going to have to make money through other revenue streams. And um, just kind of based on where we're going, you know, it really made me reflect if that in fact is really true. And what does that mean for our industry? And is there something that our government can do to prevent that? Because obviously the trends are showing that the downloading is it's increasing, it's not decreasing. And we have a culture that accepts that. So um, if something could happen where we could in fact um, have more controls over that, obviously I would love to see that. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure what that means for, you know, traditional music and recording music as we know it today. Amy. I'd like to see us deal with this persnickety little thing called Ticketmaster and Live Nation mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because, you know, everything is sort of getting shunted over to the touring business that is being, you know, choked and strangled and killed before our very eyes too. And, you know, yesterday, having a conversation with a booking agent friend of mine who was going home with a migraine because he said, all I do all day long is negotiate reductions or show cancellations. It's a bloodbath. And, you know, for a band like Ozo Motley, who their product is their live show, and their live show is honed to a very high level, and it's not something that they can now rely on to be the mainstay of their career, and this is a band that's never sold records. Um, I don't know what the answer is, except that, you know, 
I was disappointed because in this really, you know, inspiring closed door managers meeting on Sunday where we spent four hours sort of talking about the state of our business, this point was glossed over. Um, and I think it's a really glaring and concerning issue and um, I'd like to sort of reconvene on it next year at this conference and hopefully make some changes to get service fees and this fucked up monopoly in line once and for all. Thanks, Amy. Well, it's, it's kind of the eternal question. We've, we've, now, we've actually got the Celestial Jukebox. You can hear any music anytime for free. And we've got to figure out a way to, to have it feel like free. But uh, have mechanisms in place that funnels money, fair compensation to artists. And whether this is some kind of collective licensing system that goes across borders and jurisdictions uh, with performing rights societies, um, there's just got to be more places that artists are getting a little tiny fraction of something that eventually adds up. Um, the digital, uh, the performance right for sound recordings in, in the U.S., which is just a fundamental thing that hopefully is on the verge of passing soon, will bring us in line with the rest of the world. That'd be one thing. Uh, the revenue, we haven't even mentioned sound exchange, but revenue from sound exchange is definitely going up. It's, it's not going up exponentially yet, but maybe it will eventually go up. Uh, and, and it's certainly increasing, and that, that's becoming more meaningful as opposed to sort of chump change, which it was when it first started out. But um, hopefully all these various pots will add up to a, to a real going concern in terms of a career for artists who deserve it. Thanks. Okay, Mark, last word. Okay. <laughs> um, Bertus said a lot of what I would have said. Uh, I guess I'll add that um, it would be nice to see all of the people that benefit from uh, the technological... Uh, the technological developments and products that file sharing has uh, created a marketplace for to ultimately address the compensation of the artists who's uh, recorded an original material is actually driving all of that activity. The need for broadband, the need for um, uh, drives, etc. Just gear that everybody has to have, buying computers because they need more space, etc. There's, there's really should be artist compensation somewhere in that model. I know it sounds a little bit pie in the sky and naive, but um, if things like performance royalties can be addressed by Congress, um, I got to believe that there's something out there that can actually create a benefit for everyone from the fact that people are inspired enough about music to be sharing it with each other. And uh, to what Amy said, I think I would just say that the marketplace seems to be addressing some of those issues on a daily basis, which is unfortunately why the agent had a migraine yesterday, because there's just too much out there and not enough demand for it. Um, unfortunately, none of us can do anything about a lot of it. Uh, we can only really address it individually in the careers that we're involved with, but it's serious stuff. And when things go away, um, people will understand what the problem is. <laughs> uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a fabulous conversation.